all the participants. Yeah, especially welcome all the participants. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever the part of the world you are attending now. Welcome to the Women in Africa webinar series by Nancy Odor. First, I would like to introduce our society, GRSS. Mostly, can you see my screen? Okay, this is the backbone of our idea team, Inspire, Develop, Empower, Advanced Committee. And we are a part of GRSS. And GRSS is basically the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society, which is a technical society of Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineering. And this is our idea committee. We inspire, develop, empower, and advance all the GRSS committee in the field of remote sensing and GIS. All of you can also follow us on our different social media accounts like Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We are so active. And we are also organizing some of the sessions at IGAS 2022, which will happen in Pasadena, California, USA, like panel discussion, lunch on, breaking session, and geo -dress. Women in Africa webinar series is an, quite an, an innovative, activity that has been proposed by our committee, basically dealing with the women studying and working in geoscience fields, especially mothers from Africa, who would like to have given some in insights to them. And we would like to request all the participants to switch off the video and audio until unless requested. And you can type your questions in the Q&A window, which will be answered after the lecture. And sorry for the interruption. Yeah, coming to, towards today's topic is on family career and for geospatial folks, gap for motherhood and challenges and advantages by Nancy Other. She's currently pursuing her PhD in marine geochemistry and geology at Lebanese Center of Tropical Marine Research at Germany. She jo jointly holds her master's degree in Water and Coastal Management from Cadiz University, Spain, and University of Algarve, Portugal. She also has a bachelor's in degree in Environmental Science from Kenyatta University, Kenya. And she is a co-founder and director at Coma Kenya. Worked as an associate research scientist at Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute. And she is also a tutorial fellow at Technical University of Mombasa, and Pawani University, Kenya. Over to you, Nancy. The floor is yours. You can, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Sunny, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, yeah, good uh, morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, because I'm not sure where everybody is. And yeah, I would uh, like to share my presentation because I made a short presentation to guide us through the through the workshop. So uh, I expect us to have an open discussion by because to me and from what I've experienced, I know that there are so many challenges that we are experiencing in terms of family, in terms of career that are really diverse and cannot be uh, just be measured from one person's experience. So this is why I expect us to have an open discussion and we will draw, uh, we draw our uh, opinions and I share ideas from the diverse uh, experiences that we have had and how we can help others who are also aspiring to go through the same or who are already experiencing it. Yeah, because I believe that there are a lot of challenges that people are experiencing, and it may not be only in Africa or um, only as mothers, but these challenges can also cut across depending with where you are in, in your career. Yeah, so I would request to share my screen. While my profile looks to some people maybe, depending with the level of your career, it looks really impressive. 
because you can see that yeah, at 38, 17, a child who is already 17, I'm doing my PhD, I have an MSc, all of them from abroad. And also I, I, I did a BSc at that same stage. And I also have a lot of things running. So it looks very smooth, but basically this is how my real life is. So it's, it's, it's not easy and it wasn't easy from the start. So why do I say this? I am a typical African child. That young girl there is me. So I attended a village primary school. And uh, yeah, I was, or I am, the fourth born in a family of eight, seven girls and one boy. And then after uh, my brother, like my father held the African traditions. So he was for the boy child during that time. So this is something that was common in the early African traditions whereby the boys were given superior opportunity. So my brother dropped at class five level, that is according to our system. And that's where our dad stopped uh, paying school fees for all of us girls because he never saw a need of educating a girl child. Yeah, so that's what happened. So after finishing uh, primary school, my mom struggled. After finishing primary school, I failed to secure a chance for high school, although I performed very, I was the second best in my school, but I failed to secure a chance to go to high school because of school fees. So from this, this showed me, uh, I had to stay at home for one year. During this one year, I was a very good uh, hearts girl. I was taking care of my dad's animals. So this is how I got in love with nature. Yeah. So after that, there was a village school that was opened in our place. And then that's how I ended up joining because they were looking for the students who are best students, but were having problem with joining school. So after one year, I got a chance to join this uh, village school. It was a village mixed day school. So from there, I managed to qualify for the university. And during that time, I was the only person who qualified to go to the university. And that's how I got admitted to the university at Kenyatta University to do environmental education. But after starting the course, I wasn't happy with it because they were talking about journalism and I wasn't good in languages. So I didn't like it at all. And then I requested to shift to uh, environmental sciences. So when I was doing the environmental sciences course, I became aware of Kenya Marine uh, and Fisheries. I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, Nancy. Uh, I think still we are viewing the first slide. Okay. So, so you are in the first slide or changing? Uh, yeah, now we can uh, see. Okay, thank you. Okay, the fourth slide. Okay, so yeah, so but this one does not oh, have a lot of stuff. Should I move to the from current slide? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so here I was, I talked about this real story of my life. That was me in the high, in the primary school. Can you see it? Yes, yes, we can see it. Yeah, and then how I joined the environmental sciences. So during that time, I became aware of the, Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute during our field trip. And then after my graduation, I offered to volunteer there. So this is how I became a marine scientist. So during that time, uh, when volunteering at Kenya Marine Research Institute, I got an opportunity or a scholarship to study. Um, it was an interdisciplinary, but it was still on the biogeosciences. So that's how I did my master's. I got a master's scholarship in Spain and that's where I did my master's. It was a joint between Spain and uh, Portugal and, and Bologna University in Italy. So during this time, I still had my, I had my first child when I was, I, before I joined university, my first graduation. And then the second one after the second graduation. So I was a mother of two when I started my master's. And then, yeah, from there, I learned from the different, from different uh, colleagues. So whatever shaped my life during this time, it was about my family who 
I have my sister, my elder sister, who was always pushing me to do things. My elder sister, and then also after starting my volunteer uh, work at Kenya Marine, I got colleagues who are always abroad studying different things, and this uh, developed my curiosity. So with my motivations, I was really motivated to be where to be or to do what they were doing. And through volunteering, I learned a lot. And this is what shaped me into the research. And I was able to learn how to develop proposals, write grant proposals, do technical field works, uh, and also the laboratory uh, things. So, yeah. So uh, this, was, this is what led me to, or led us to start a, an organization, which is ERACOMA. And it's basically a research and conservation organization. And whatever we are focusing on more is the student mentorship and training, because we felt that this is a gap that is missing. And it is something that I experienced in early career, in my early career, yeah, because everything was a struggle, even to get a volunteer position, it was a struggle. Yeah, so, uh, so as I said, that most, the most important thing that shaped my life was the family, how they viewed everything, how my sister pushed me. So, what is a family like in your context? So if you ask most people, this is what a family looks like. It's always mother, father, and children, or the parents and the children. So it is you, this is where you get your comfort, where you are low. This is where you, you need rest. And this is where you expect everything they will never reject you. And this is why in most of us, we always have this family. And in an African context, children are important. And there, was, there is always a satisfying uh, will for the children. And then one advantage that makes family more important. The reason why I was able to have my undergraduate when I already had my son is because my sisters were there, my parents were there. They could help. And, um, this also happened in the, in the upper stages of my career. But now the problem comes when you have to shift to a different uh, community, like now the way I'm doing my PhD in a different environment in Germany. And then here I have to be with my child, but they have a different opinion of the child support. Because here you don't have a person, any person, who helps you take care of the child. The child belongs purely to the parents. So it's individualism kind of parenting or family. So you don't expect a neighbor, you don't expect anyone to come help you. And like at home that you can drop the child at your sister's place or your mom or somebody can come in. So it's really challenging and always demanding in terms of uh, emotional requirement for the person. Yeah. So as a mother, basically, there are a lot of things that are required of us. You are the disciplinarian, you are the health care provider, you are the manager of the family because you're supposed to be there, make sure that the, the house is cleaned, everything is done, uh, shopping is done and everything, and even the, ch the children's teacher. So if you have kids already, you have to take, make sure that homework is done. You are also supposed to cook. Sorry, Nancy, again, the, uh, uh, it is frozen. I think if you can uh, click on uh, the slides, are you talking on slide five only? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, in slide seven. Yeah, uh, so this is- uh, Hi, Nazi. Nazi? Yes? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, then your slide, then your screen, click the- the last icon before just before the no down 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 on your bottom bottom yeah the Legs. last one this one yes click that one i think it's the one that got frozen again okay okay sorry if it's okay if 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 you're not seeing the, the things please let me know on time yeah so yeah so we have several roles as mothers in the in the family now mine is not working.
Yeah, that is expected of us. And this is what makes us too uh, fixed to the family. So the reason why we fix ourselves also to this is because of the way we were raised. When we are raised, we see our mothers doing everything to the family and we feel that this is part of us and this is what we should do throughout. Yeah, so, and then mostly like in my, uh, where I come from or in the African context, this is basically a woman's work. So you may find, unless you have a very supportive spouse who also understand what you are doing, then they will come in to share the responsibilities with you. But otherwise you will always have to stand up for all uh, these days. So one thing is that uh, you have to do this in your family and then you still have the career running and you have the research that is going on that you have to, to, to do. So what makes it possible in uh, developed countries or like now I'm in Germany is that we have very strong childcare uh, policies and at least the spouses share share the responsibility. So this is why I say in the African context, because these are things that do not happen into in our, uh, in our place. So if you look at the careers in geosciences, so this is basically all the sciences. We have a lot of requirements in terms of research. You have to spend a lot of hours in the lab. You have to spend a lot of hours in the field doing sampling because everything is based on evidence, facts, experience, experiments. And for you to achieve a successful career, you need to publish. How can you publish when you have to spend time in the house? It's really difficult. And one thing that we have to know, and I think it's always demotivating to most people and especially the young ones who are still looking forward to have a career in sciences. But is it really possible? That is one question that we have to ask. Are we the first to do it? Yeah. So how can we go about it? Yeah. So is it possible to be a parent and have a career in research? This is a question that everybody or every young mother asks or every young female person who is willing to or who is intending to have a family always goes through. So is it possible to have a great, to be a great parent and be also a great researcher at the same time? in an area where you are competing with people because it's about competition. For you to stand out in research, you have to be always working, be always in the research, be always publishing. But can you manage to do this? But the question um, I always tend to ask myself wherever I'm stuck with my family uh, and uh, career staff is that, will I be the first person to do this? And uh, for the funny thing is that with the presence of website, or with the internet currently, if almost everything is online. So I went around to search on the previous <clears throat> great scientists, and I wanted to find out if we really had women involved and how did they manage? Do they have families? And how did uh, all this happen? So as we look forward as the senior or uh, senior researchers or scientists to be our mentors, do we have those who stand out that were in the same position that we are in today? So if you look at this, you will find that the research was basically dominated by men. And the few female who stood out, sorry, I think uh, because of the, yeah, the few female, there is a, there are some slides that I'll move. The red should be on Mary Tapp and uh, Mary Anning and the Thomas Crowder. I think there is a discussion because of the uh, because of the slide view. Yeah. So you find that the publicity of women has really been affected, and this can also be demotivating to the to the women who are intending to in, in uh, to establish themselves in the in the research or in STEM. I also tried to look at the top scientists that we have globally. So I found uh, three out of 200, I found that uh, three of them were women and most of all of them were in US. And this is based on the publications. So the next thing that I asked myself, do we have adequate role models from Africa that can inspire us to do whatever we want to achieve? or enable us to 
move where we want to be. So I take a close look at Mary Tab's profiles, I, the, the profiles of these, because I look at them and then I, I was curious on how did they manage? Did they have family and the, the research at the same time? So I moved to closer look and then I look at Merita. So one, one thing, Merita was a, uh, a, a geologist and she was making maps for that. And then she was working closely with Harry Hammond Hess, which is a male. So if you look at their profiles, this is what you'll find out about uh, Merita. There is nothing that is talking about her family. And the thing is that she was inspired by her dad. So it means that the people who are close to us are basically who make us what we are. If you come to, uh, to her profile, you find that there is something striking. He had a family, he had children, and he had a wife. So how did he manage to do all this? Uh, can we, if for men, it is easy. For women, it is difficult, but why? It's because of the responsibilities, which when you cannot fulfill, then you are deemed like it's not possible. Then I move close to our African uh, scientist. So Wangari Madai was a very strong woman, an African ecologist. She was the first to win a Nobel Peace Prize. She was the founder of Green Belt Movement. And then, her work was always considered unwelcome and she was too strong for a woman. That is how they termed her. And she was married, but separated and later divorced. Why? Because she was accused of being strong-minded. So how does this, what, what does this mean to our young people who are intending to get into the field? Can they really manage to do the science and also be in the family. And what does the being strong-minded mean? So this, most of these things are based on our culture, whereby we are, uh, women are not supposed to make decisions. So this is why most of the things happened. Like adult, she was accused of adultery because adultery was one of the points that you could get a divorce. But is it possible to survive in a relationship without getting a divorce and have a career in research. I also try to look at another uh, scientist. She's currently, she's a, a, a very senior, famous South African scientist, Tebelo Nyokong. I'm not so much familiar about it, but it was just out of curiosity. And one thing that I found about our senior researchers or scientists is that most of them have no information about their families. So I was asking myself, how can they inspire us, people who are or who are intending to have families and run career? Is it because of the fear of publicity? What can happen if I reveal my family status in a, in a, a, a research work or in a job interview? Will they admit you or how does it happen? And what does this mean to the current society? It's not only in Africa, but I think in most developing countries, this is a, a big problem. While we are not uh, allowed or we are not supposed to reveal our family issues at work, but they are things that affect us directly and they affect our performance. So what are some of the challenges? Is it possible to integrate work, a research work and family? What are some of the challenges that we have? So one thing is that we have a very strong opinion about the society. And as women, we do make a very strong feeling of the society burden on us. Like the society's definition of a hardworking woman. So how do you, does the society define a hardworking woman? So this is a woman who can be struggling inside the house and struggling outside the house. You can do all the house calls. You can cook on time. You can have the children get to school. You can do everything. And then again, at your work, you have to be in the field doing research. You have to be uh, writing papers. But is it really possible to have all this? That is one question that we can ask ourselves. So another thing is that the course we do, because this is how, when we grew up, our parents were, this is what they taught us that a woman should do. 
So these are some of the things that uh, put us down. So one thing is that combining all these roles, you have the family roles, they are really draining emotionally, energy, and even the health. And to be sincere for those people who are married, if you are in the field the whole day, or you are in a lab that with some things that are not working, you will not be able to function, even offer you a, or be in a mentally stable condition, even to have your, how is it called? Conjugal, or how is it called maybe? Yeah, even to be able to, to, to interact with your partner, it's not possible. So it's emotionally draining. Another problem that we have is that we have very few opportunities in research and sciences for, for in Africa. So many nationalities, they don't invest in research and most of the opportunities are outside. But another thing is that the opportunities that are available, they require experience. But how do we get the experience without even getting opportunity to work? So this makes uh, people, you have to volunteer and by volunteering, most of these senior people are men. And again, being men is that you have to do some, to work under some conditions. And there is a lot of discrimination. There are some things that we deem that, oh, women cannot do this. This is too strong for a, a woman to do. It requires a lot of energy. We also have long working hours. And then with long working hours with the senior people who are also men, this exposes women to a lot of sexual harassment. There is always that mother guilt. You are working, but you are uh, not sure about your kids. You are like, what time, what, how are my kids doing? You are in the field without network, you can never work because you are not sure of what is happening at home. So all this uh, affects the women performance. Another thing is that uh, uh, for the people who have managed to work, for people to work for them successfully in the field of research, most of them are working couples. If you work in the same thing, then you can spend all the time together in the field. Then this builds trust because at least everybody trusts each other as they can see each other all the time. So there is a lot of trust that is being built. But the problem comes where you have the children. So where does this leave the kids? Okay, so, uh, yeah. So I was uh, looking at some work that were done in the US. They were asking about women and they, if they are happy with their careers and about sexual harassment. So these are some of the results that you can see. So about 40% of women are uh, say that they are satisfied. 24 say no, they're just doing it maybe because of the financial requirement, but they are not happy. And again, you can see that sexual harassment and misconduct is really, really high. And this does not only affect STEM, this affects in all careers. Uh, these are some of the challenges that were also discussed in a uh, paper. Sorry, I didn't uh, write the, the source, but I have to put it after this. Yeah, so these are some of the things that are affecting the challenges that are felt by female scientists, lack of work-home balance, because we always want to be perfectionists. I want to uh, attend to 100% to my kids, and I want to attend 100% to my work, which is not possible. So uh, there is a lot of things, discrimination and harassment, work environment, which is not accommodative, lack of professional resources, childbirth and childcare. Like in Africa, I think there is no provision apart from the leave that you are given, but in private sector, this is also limited. There is less time that is allocated to women to attend to both child, uh, family and uh, their careers. And in research, this makes things very difficult because the more time you spend in the field, the more time you deny to your family. And this creates a lot of problems within the family. And most uh, family ends up uh, collapsing. So yeah, one of the interesting things was that, that I found was a very successful story, Marcia McNutt. So she is the current, she was the 22nd president of the National Academy of Sciences. And she managed to do her research. She was a professor in marine sciences and she had three children and a husband. But how did she manage to do this? So it is possible, like 
There are fear, but it's possible. There are people who have succeeded. You can see. One thing is that we cannot do everything alone. So if you want to succeed, you need to have something. You see? So she was having a help, house help. So while there are many, it can be expensive, but it is really relieving. So if you can get a help where possible, get a help. And uh, yeah, Marcia also currently runs a TV show, Discover Women. You can maybe browse and check something about it. So she's currently encouraging fellow women who are also having problems with uh, breaking the, the barriers and uh, creating the stereotypes, the harassment that people get through. We also have things that even the payment in some countries is, is uh, stereotyped where women are paid less, yeah. So what can we do to overcome some of the obstacles? So these are based on my own experiences. So you can see like uh, in one of these, I was working, you have a deadline and you have a child who is not going to sleep. So sometimes you just have to do what can be done. If you can work with her as long as she's quiet, be able to do that. So overcoming mother guilt. If you can do home office comfortably with your child, do it. And then if you have, normally what I do is that when I see even a conference or a workshop, I ask, do they provide childcare? Because here I am alone with my child. So I depend on the kindergarten. And if I get opportunity, I ask for childcare. And this is why you see here, I was able to attend the conference with my child because they provided the childcare. So even adapting in new environments, Always you need to, before you move to a new environment, look for the opportunities for you. How can you be able to survive? How can you be able to live there with your child if you're moving with your child alone? Or how can your family, how can you make the family balance with your, with your, with your work that you're going to do there? Um, uh, contact the colleagues that are there. Look for people who are having similar situations. Look for conferences, workshops, Online, currently, there are a lot of things that you can find all this information, and this will help you to, uh, to survive. So some of the things that you have to do to reduce the stress that comes along with this is that you have to accept your situation. You are a mother. You are a wife. You are a researcher. You have to first accept. So if you accept that you are a mother, you always be feeling comfortable to drag your child along. Before you move to do something, you have to ask, do they provide childcare? Because you are, accept that you are a mother first and then you are a researcher. So you have to do them both together. And then avoid seeking sympathy. So one of the things that most women have that I've noticed with many people, yes, you have a child, but it's your child. It was your own decision. So how do you make people, because when you say, oh, I have a child, I cannot do this, you keep on making excuses, you will not achieve anything. And even in research, people will run away from you. Your colleagues will avoid working with you because they already know that you will create an excuse on order not to do something. But if you want to achieve something, first make sure, tell somebody, I can do it and make sure that you do some, you do it. If you have a work plan with your work group team, make sure that you plan it and do it on time. And one of, of the things that I've realized is that mothers are always the most organized people because they have that child, they have, they know that there are some time that is already scrapped from their schedule. So the available time, they make sure that they, ma they maximize its use. And most of them survive uh, or succeed well, those who decide to succeed, to work, succeed well compared to people who are just living on their career. Another thing is believe in yourself. People will criticize you because I remember when I first moved, I left my child, she was only two years. And then there was a lot of tension that, oh, you've left a very small child, you don't care, you don't do this, but nobody knew what I was doing actually. So you will criticize, you will find a lot of criticism, but believe in yourself. If you know what you want, don't uh, listen to a lot of uh, society, what the society says about you, what other people feel about you. Be yourself, build self-confidence and do what you can do. Another thing is that dedication and self-programming. If the child needs your time, 
give her that time, create your time for that and for the career, let the career time be career time. And then another thing is hard work. Hard work does not mean that you kill yourself, know your limits. Uh, one, one of the uh, quotes that I, I found when we were having a mother's and uh, son's career fair that motivated me was that most, most parents or most mothers feel really happy about being balancing being career and family. It's an achievement and it's only for the chosen few. So if you can do it, it's something that even you can use to sell yourself. And then for you to succeed, you have to go for some for, for it. Don't expect somebody to go fight for you. So as Nancy Hopkins said uh, about sexism, workplace harassment and uh, micro, microaggressions, she said that she didn't expect in their lab, she was the first woman in the uh, biology, but she stood there for herself because there was discrimination. She was always criticized, but she said that she had to fight. And she's one of the successful scientists that we have that uh, globally. So we have also some external factors like flexible work timing. If you can do home office, do that. Request for that. Also look for women friendly uh, work. We have some organizations that offer this. If you are a mother, we can offer you this. So this is very common in the developed countries, but in most developing countries, it's a, it's a, a, a difficult thing. Also look for mentorship. Look for people who have gone through this, who are offering these opportunities. Look for these people and talk to them. They will guide you. They will show you on how things can be done, but you still have to do it yourself. Yeah. So my final remarks is that it's not yet, if you somebody is not yet decided about choosing a career, then we have so many scientific careers that you can do even while managing your, your family. They have less traveling, they have uh, less, you can easily balance them. So choose something that can help you balance with your family. And if you have not yet gotten a spouse, it's easy to work when you are working together with your spouse because you spend much time together. So choose a spouse that understands your work. Another thing, never feel guilty, just give your best. You can never be a perfect mother and you can never be a perfect scientist. So just do what you can do. And there is no perfect formula for parenting. So if somebody says something that, okay, you are left your family, that should not bother you. Just do to your maximum, to your capacity. Again, know your limits. Don't overwork yourself because when you are mentally down, you can never do anything. Just know your limits and work with good planning, work on them. Another thing is that always call for help wherever necessary. If you can get a house help to help you do the, the house activities, better do that. If you can get childcare, always look around and see how you can get help because it's not easy. And with help, things are easily done. Another thing is network. Currently we have social media. There are a lot of organizations, a lot of groups that are working on mothers in sciences, women in sciences all over the globe. You can find this and you can find a lot of information that can easily help you to uh, establish yourself. So find a team that matches your needs and network. Remember birds of the same feathers worked, flock together. And you cannot fly like an eagle by wording with the ducks. So you have to just go with the eagles, practice with the eagles and be an eagle. Yeah, so uh, one uh, last thing is that managing, I would like to say is that managing career um, um, in research and uh, family roles is really difficult, but it is very possible. It just requires you, uh, you getting into the driver's seat and starting to drive. Because if you don't drive it, no one will do it for you. You have to get it towards your decision, so you have to get to it and do it. Thank you very much. If you have any questions. Thank you, Nancy. It was indeed a wonderful presentation. Some of the words were like piercing through the heart. It was indeed a good presentation. And I think there are more, more, more stories which have been motivated, motivated all the participants especially the women participants would be motivated with the real stories that you have described us and you yourself 
is one of the story that can be more taken as a motivation by all the participants and if someone is having a doubt in their heart that can i do it yes indeed you can do it you have a live example set by nancy here and if you have some queries you can go ahead in the chat window nancy would you like to have an one on one interaction or would you prefer me to read the questions in the chat window you mean you after prefer. after the talk or yeah yeah now would you need yeah, have a yeah, one on one interaction yeah if we have questions in the chat if there are somebody who is asking for or some clarity about something. Yeah, Angeline, you can ask a question. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending where you are joining in from. Thank you for that presentation. My name is Angeline and I'm joining in from um, Namibia. My question is, um, when you started in your career, because I'm still a young a geoscientist, I'm actually a geologist. When you started your career, like in your early years, how were you coping in the male dominant industry? Should I answer or there is um, another question? You can go ahead, Nancy. Yeah, thank you, Angeline. Yeah, it's uh, as I said earlier, it's really not easy for women to establish themselves, especially in the field of geology. And this is because of the demand in field work. But if you know what you want as a woman, and you know that you can do it, it's possible to do it without looking for sympathy, with doing things right. And the reason why most of our girls fall most ladies fall for sexual harassment is because of looking for sympathy. You want to achieve something that you know that you don't, you in your mental uh, capacity, you feel very like you already feel intimidated that I can't do it. So if you say that I can do it, it doesn't matter who is leading you. So to, it, it can't be that you are lead, your superior is a man or is a woman but anybody can give you, lead you towards the direction that you want to be. And this will create, when you have the self-confidence in you, when somebody starts intimidating you, you move to the next person who you think works in your direction. Because the, uh, the reality is that the leadership in geology and other, in most sciences are men. And Spending more time with men, it is just natural. Anything can happen. So it's upon you to organize yourself and be ready. Stand for yourself. Okay, thank you for your answer. Much appreciated. Uh, Nancy, I have a question here followed by the answer you replied, uh, you gave. Uh, definitely always as there is a proverb uh, behind every successful man there is a woman uh, what I believe and what I have witnessed single either a single man or a single woman cannot do anything they need some or the other one a senior or a mentor uh, mm -hmm. sometimes the same sex sometimes the opposite sex so uh, who will support them and who will elevate uh, them to the higher level? Means if we have this mindset that, yes, I will work hard, I will study everything, I will achieve uh, uh, the way I'm working. That is absolutely true. But uh, at some part, part of the time, we need a little push or we need a little bit favor from the seniors or from the mentors. Yeah. Uh, where we would uh, we to re, uh, to achieve the higher uh, positions. So how to get deal uh, with some uh, like that situation in case uh, any uh, women gets uh, fall off? Sorry, I didn't get the question. Uh, always we need someone uh, to push ourselves. Okay. 
let us suppose a student if a teacher uh, will push uh, a student then they they forward they anchor they participate in the competition they go forward for uh, some international national competition but in the same scenario that same uh, student and teacher relationship sometimes fall into trap sometimes fall into the difficult condition if it is a male student uh, female student and a male uh, teacher then also so in that way how to get to come out from the person who is being trapped uh, here how to deal with that situation especially for a woman okay mary mary you want to answer Mary, can you talk first? No, I don't want to answer. I also have a question when she when you answer her question. Okay. Because I don't seem to get um, the, the question. The, the question. Yeah. But what I know is that uh, for everybody, that it's everything that we do comes from ourselves. Even if we need to be pushed, if we are not willing to do it, we will not do it. And this is why I say that once you spot something, if you want to do a research, this is the kind of research that you want to do. The thing is like drawing from my own uh, experience, wherever I focus that I want to do this research, sometimes I even want to wake up in the middle of the night with, with ideas and you have to put it down. And this is because it's in you. But yes. if you don't want to do something, however much somebody pushes you, you will never do it. And that's why I say that you be conscious with what you want, get up, take the driver's seat, start driving. Because if you don't do it, nobody will. Okay, okay. thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah Mary? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, was, I have a question. Uh, if you have a mentor, uh, because Lately, I realized that there are some times when your mentor, when you're already above what your mentor could give you, because at every stage in life, we get mentors. Mm -hmm. And there are times you want to move away from a mentor because you see already that a mentor has nothing that the mentor is adding to you. But the mentor still looks at you as a mentee and wants to keep you still under them even if they are now, even if they know that, you, okay, yeah, you have upgraded and you are now more than them. Not that more than them in, in, in maybe, I don't know, maybe you are now, you can now teach them things. You can instead become a their mentor, but they want to keep you as a mentee because they don't, they don't want that, they, want, they don't want to lose that ego. Like, okay, this is my mentee and I don't want it to be a mentor. I don't want her to be a mentor. How do you deal with such a situation? Because in your sciences, it's very easy to always get a mentor, to want to get a mentor, or to want to get somebody that you want to work with that you see like the person is okay. The person can really orientate you or take you to where you want to go to. But after some time, the more you get into your science, the more you, you learn, the more you grow, you, be, you, you also want to get another mentor who is higher than the other, the, your previous mentor or your ex-mentor. But the mentor doesn't want to let you go. The mentor sees you as an everlasting mentee. So how do we deal with a situation that our mentor, how do we tell our mentor, okay, your time is up with me. I want to move ahead with another mentor. Or how do you deal with that kind of a situation? So thank you, Mary, for the question. Yeah, I think about mentorship, it's uh, a mentor should not be somebody that you can stay with throughout your life. And from drawing from my own experience, I've had so many mentors along the way. And most of them, as I move to the next level, you have a new environment, new kind of people. And one thing is that uh, a mentor who tries to keep you, you must be an essential resource to them. And most of them that I've seen wanting to keep people is when you have now become so good and you are working totally for 
them. And it's like when you now try to move on yourself, they feel that you are sort of a threat, a competitor, which is not good actually. It's not ethical in research actually. And uh, from my side, I've been very lucky that I've had great mentors. Some are women, some are men. And one thing is that they are always proud with my move. And wherever I do something, I share with them that, oh, I was thinking about this. This is what I'm currently doing. And some of them even follow my life. And even before I made a decision, some decisions, I contact them. And this is because they feel that I'm now free, a free being, and they are proud of what they have impacted. But when a mentor doesn't want you to leave, I think this is a kind of different story. And this is always a, a, a feeling of um, competition normally, because now you have become so good, you can be doing things on your own and you will always establish yourself in the same research. And now you will be tapping into the resources that you are already impacted in you. So I think you should also be careful when dealing with mentors. And think about, this is your mentor, he has a different life. This is you, you have a different life. So you should compare, write down what makes you, what else do you need? Can you start looking for other opportunities? Because it means that when you stick to him or her, you will be stuck there forever. But this is not uh, what anybody needs in their career. So you need to think about it and make your own decision on what you want. I hope that helps. Thank you, Nancy. So indeed, it was a wonderful session. So if anybody has any further questions, you can always reach out Nancy into her social media account and through the email. So yeah. Thank you, everyone.